This is uh, the Kathmandu Guest House in Nepal, September 18th, a Sunday, 2005, and it's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to talk with uh, Michael Allen, who I just met the other day for the first time, and to ask him a few questions about his background, his life, and his uh, practice of anthropology. Michael, if I may begin, could you tell me when you were born and where you were born, and into what family? I was born into a rather rare species of humanity these days, I suppose, in 1928, into a, uh, an Anglo-Irish family, which was then, I suppose, only about 5% of the population. I gather it's now less than two. Uh, and I suppose the most thing I can, but the thing I remember most vividly about growing up in Ireland was the Protestantized side of it, and well, I went to Protestant schools, they were all boarding schools, absolute nightmares. Uh, and a sense of mysterious difference with the rest of the Irish population, that they were as much other as, as if they were in Africa almost. Uh, for the, the, uh, that degree of closure, the Anglo-Irish community I lived in. I went to Trinity College Dublin, as virtually all Protestant Irish did. It was then, there were no Catholics in Trinity. Not, not through any Protestant prohibition, but the, uh, the Archbishop required dispensation from Rome for, for a Catholic to go there. So that, that was a further re reinforcement of, of um, the, the pro Protestant world that I was very much saturated. Not that I was in the least... By, by the age of 20, I think I had ceased to believe at all in, in Protestantism. I, I found it even repulsive. Uh, and very rapidly became, a, I suppose, a somewhat rabid atheist at that stage. And I studied philosophy, which was called Mental and Moral Science at Trinity. And fortunately managed to get a first-class degree of four years of philosophy that was a mixture, really, of psychology, uh, logic, and metaphysics. But never got beyond Hegel. And I did not like Hegel. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I seem to be able to understand it. Though subsequently, I've, I've been fascinated with going back to Hegel at times, relating it to my training as an anthropologist, his view of uh, uh, the, the whole social process or whatever, politicization of it. I've, I found it very frequently very insightful. But with a first class honours degree in mental and moral science from Trinity College Dublin, then there are about two things you could do. You become a Church of Ireland clergyman, which is quite clearly what I've said. That was not a track I was going down. Or I could uh, apply for one or two Protestant firms, Guinness being the cardinal one. So I wound up a trainee brewer in Guinnesses. Three years of nightmare life, Park Royal in London, shortly after the war. Long queues for me, smog everywhere. British class system. The whole thing filled me with complete, uh, well, only one thing, waiting for the moment I could get out of it. So it was saving, saving, saving money from a tiny salary until uh, uh, a wonderful chance came. A fellow Irishman I'd known in school who was an extreme adventurer, still is in fact, and he writes travel books, got a job teaching English at the Royal Military Academy in Kabul and said to Clarion Call, Michael will come, we will have great adventures. What was his name? Peter Somerville Large. Sure. Know his books. <laughs> so I went out. I resigned from, from Guinness and went out and joined them. And we had indeed uh, many intriguing adventures, mainly in Badakhshan, uh, and mainly trying to get out of Afghanistan. We had absolutely ludicrous ambitions. We wanted to enter into Russian Central Asia, to cross the whole of Russia into Siberia, walk, you might all say, metaphorically, barefoot across the Bering Straits, arrive in America, become famous and retire as Irish gents. Luckily, we were entirely impeded all along the Himalayas and any of these ambitions. But getting to anthropology, uh, my first hint, there was no such thing as anthropology in Ireland then. There isn't even very much now apart from Northern Ireland and at Maynooth. But there was none at all then. I didn't, I suppose the, all that the word meant to me was measuring skulls or something, the usual public image at that time of anthropology. I met uh, some Norwegian, uh, not Norwegian, Swedish uh, archaeologists and linguists working at Barmian, that place, of course, you know, was destroyed. Mm. And what they were doing somewhat intrigued me, but then we moved down into, into uh, Bashar, to Swat, 
we went up to Hunza. And in Peshawar, before going up to Hunza, I met Frederick Bath, who was taking a, a, a break from his work. And at the time, I was suffering from hepatitis, and the wretched man said, the best thing is whiskey. <laughs> Which, well, somehow or other, he was right. <laughs> We'd had quite a number of whiskeys, and three weeks later, I'd well recovered. But he, he talked to me over those whiskeys intensely of what he was doing, and I thought, this indeed, if I can ever be an anthropologist, what I be groping towards to, to to live amongst people who, uh, as my own experience in Ireland, the Catholics were mysterious, not easy to understand why they did what they did, seemed to me an utterly fascinating task. And lo and behold, it was a profession, there's a chance you might even earn a real penny in it. <laughs> that stuck in my head with further adventures in the Himalayas here, and I came to Nepal for the first time, and then we spent about four months my friend Nucci Bahado, who was just starting a Nandakuti school with Damrit and Nanda. Uh, and we had adventures with the most decrepit kind after a big game down at Kailali Kanchanpur. Some ranas misorganized, luckily, so there's no chance of fitting anything. <laughs> and on to Bhutan. We also penetrated about halfway up into Bhutan with our permits and uh, were arrested and were dealt with by the Indian authorities in a very civil manner as just lunatic young Irishmen. And eventually got to Australia and spent about nine months working in a gold mine there, saving up money, thinking maybe I'd go to what I had learned from Bath would be one of the meccas of anthropology, Chicago. And Chicago means something to an Irishman. But when I got to Sydney and realized that all that money I'd saved nine months in this gold mine had been spent getting to Chicago, I thought Sydney looked like, you know, it looked like a city. I'd been in the middle of the desert for nine months. I couldn't imagine Australia had, had uh, such a place at all. Might have a university. And I'd arrived to Central Railway and got directed. It was just only really a short walk from Central Railway. And of course, there it was, a, a classically a Scottish type university with this quadrangle and all the rest of it. And anthropology department, the next thing I was in Professor Elkin's office, who was the doyen of Australian anthropology at the time, uh, he's especially Australian Aborigines. And I told him you know, that I had this degree, uh, uh, is there any way I could become an anthropologist? And he said, have you got a private income? So I said, sorry, no, I don't have a private Well, there's only five of us in Australia, and none of us are very old yet. <laughs> I don't think there'll ever be any more, more or less. What, what uh, year was that? That was 1956. Uh, and the, it was the only department apart from a small nucleus of researchers that had begun under Nadell at the ANU about the same. In uh, Canberra. Couple, in Canberra, mm. a couple of years earlier. But that was purely at a level that I wasn't at yet, uh, PhD research. He said, you can enroll here as an MA qualifying student and just do the anthropology uh, units of, of a BA and uh, see what happens. And if you, if you do well, then maybe we can get some small research funds for you to, to do an MA. So I did that, and luckily uh, it, it all worked really well. In fact, the thesis I wrote, which is a comparative study of male initiations in Melanesia, le later on, about 10 years later, I published it. It's probably the, the book's given me greater fame than any other one. Uh, well, just to, you get a wonderful overview, actually, of, of the various steps that brought you to Australia and on route, yeah. of course, across Central Asia and Himalayas. But to zero in and maybe rewind a, a little, bit more um, a bit of a more focus on, on your early years, um, it, it's quite a, a step that you took with yeah. Peter Somerville Lodge to, to risk Central Asia and the Himalayas like that. Was there anything in your upbringing, your childhood, that do you think gave you a flavour uh, for something grander than, than Guinness and local aspirations? Oh, yes. I mean, at school, I was hopeless at school, and I was already getting deaf then, so I was always sitting at the back of the class, and I was always reading, uh, reading literature, and, and that certainly is hugely stern, or all kinds of literature. But I remember one day I got hold of Sven Hayden, and that <laughs> really uh, excited me, the idea that, that uh, romantic notion of, of exploration of unexplored places by Europeans, uh, which now, of course, I see in a very different light, but it certainly excited my imagination very much then. I think it was that kind of thing. It was private, private reading, and also the, the, the Anglo-Irish, by tradition in the previous generation, they ran the British Empire virtually, all helped to. They were always 
out in Africa or in India or in the Indian civil service or, or whatever. Uh, so the houses that I knew in our were full of uh, Tibetan materials, you know, wonderful tankers and prayer wheels and uh, odd objects from various parts of Africa that had been dragged back. And the, and the Irish Museum too was full of magnificent stuff, especially cooks, stuff from the Pacific. Was this true of your, of your family also? Was there some... Not, some not really. No, my or... family was much more ordinary middle class, uh, living just at the edge of Dublin. My father was a stockbroker, uh, the most useless stockbroker that ever was. He was really a watch tinkerer or something like that. He was a train engineer and, and had the misfortune, you might say, to marry the daughter of a, of a failed stockbroker. Uh, so no, there was not, not in my family, but in many of the families of friends that I made at school, lived in these big crumbling country Irish estates with, uh, with this kind of stuff and with traditions of, of exploration, of, of foreign places, of, of curiosity and uh, the diversity of the world. And that was certainly, during my teens especially, becoming more and more important. And were your family and, and friends around you supportive of your, your departure from London into the unknown, essentially? Mm. Or was that a, a battle as well? Yeah, not a battle, mm. but great puzzlement, a huge anxiety. And that anxiety was massively compounded when, and when I resigned. I went over back to, to Ireland, spent about three or four weeks sort of mm. organising things, farewelling my family. The final day came was to get the boat from Hollyhead across to... Uh, to Liverpool and then the boat to Karachi which I got left from Liverpool and there was only a few hours in Liverpool between one and the other. Uh, then there was the usual Irish weeping and wailing at Dunleary Pier. <laughs> My mother was sort of distraught. And, uh, so I got, that was finally over, grabbed a pint of Guinness. After about half an hour there was a, a call that I was wanted on, on uh, which must be a telephone, some form of communication anyway on the boat. It was my mother. They'd gone back home and they found, they knew, I had kept a, a, a tin box on the table that had all, everything, my passport, money, uh, documents, <laughs> tickets, the whole lot were there on it. <laughs> of course, she went into complete panic, what, what to do? And, and she she worked, recovered from a panic very quickly. She said, Mike, uh, I have a friend in Aer Lingus uh, maybe he can get a pilot to fly it over in the morning. I think the boat got in about eight, seven or eight in the morning, and the I was the, the other boat was going off at about midday or one o'clock. I remember getting a taxi out to the the airport, watching planes coming in. In came the Aer Lingus, and all the passengers got off. And suddenly the, it was an old-fashioned plane, cockpit opened and the pilot got out. I could see the sun shining on that. <laughs> no. Anyway, I got it. You so uh, uh, that course obviously accentuated my family's anxiety. How on earth you can this son of ours you know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> manage what is, <laughs> these ludicrous plans? Be? But they never attempted to stop me at all. No. What about brothers and sisters? Did you come from a large they, Irish family? They were very much younger. Uh, uh, well, not, my sister would was a few years younger, but she was already married. Uh, I don't think she had much grasp of what I was about at all, really. Uh, married a North of Ireland bloke who went into Marks and Spencer's, and I'm afraid uh, it, it, she disappeared into another kind of world altogether. Though later on, we've become close. My brother was still a schoolboy, he's 11 years younger. I subsequently learnt that it obviously greatly for he became a teacher of Latin in, our, in uh, first Ireland, then England, and I became redundant and hardly a wonder as Latin disappeared at about the age of 55. And then he suddenly started uh, becoming, and he still is, a, a physical explorer. He, he leads expeditions up and down the Himalayas and the Andes and God knows what else at the age of 65. And so, <laughs> And I know for certain that there was something seething there when he was young about all these reports coming back from me and my adventures while he was teaching Latin. Mm. So it obviously had some impact on him. You, know. okay, okay. you, you describe very well this, uh, 
the possibility of this travel and the possibility of just turning up in a place like Sydney, walking in, meeting a professor and saying, well, may I study? Um, one of the things, of course, that, that's happened in the discipline of anthropology since that time is the yes, institutionalization of it, of course. That these, this kind of possibility is, is rarely there anymore. Do you see that the students that you've taught have come through very different paths to the discipline? Very different. Though many of them still share some of, I suppose, you could say, uh, the romantic component. The, the romantic in the sense of a, a fascination with, uh, with the other and but an increasing capacity to see the other in themselves. Uh, and of course, another major restriction in, in limiting the ambitions of many PhD, uh, PhD students are starting are, are now the terms of scholarship, too, that they're so miserable, they're so short, uh, especially if you're going into an area where very little preliminary language learning can be carried out. Uh, that, that seriously limits possibilities. So I'd, I'd say now in Sydney University, two thirds of the students uh, are, are working in Australia, uh, either in exotic communities in Australia or on some central feature of modern contemporary Australian society. Mm. I know, of course, your work through Nepal. In fact, yeah. you hinted just before we started the interview that actually. Uh, not only is that not your whole portfolio, mm. but it's not even the work for which you've become most renowned. Perhaps you could also give a little overview of the various places you've worked and the yeah. periods that you worked there and what drew you to those places. Well, so when I finished that MA qualifying at, at uh, Sydney, John Barnes had arrived during the last year of when I was doing fourth year honours, in fact, and, and uh, we got on very well together. And he was very impressed, seemingly, with, with my thesis. And he then immediately moved up to the chair at the ANU. And he took me and another student up as his first PhD students to the ANU. So there I was um, at the ANU. And at that time, though there was no uh, prohibition against where you worked, it was uh, nobody knew anything about anywhere else other than the, the Pacific, part than John Barnes. But John Barnes was not going to break that tradition either. He didn't want to send people off to Africa, as far as I can see. He immediately uh, tried to acquaint himself with Papua New Guinea because of Medell's interest. And the first things he wrote were on, on I think, the Mungan kinship system in, in Australia, on the average, though he never did any research there. So he wasn't going to change that, that policy, a primary focus on the, the Pacific Australia and surrounding Pacific area. And at the time, the, just about the time I arrived at the ANU, the British administration in the condominium of, that, of the New Hebrides, at that stage was still jointly administered by Britain and France, uh, so, so subsequently became Sir John. Sir John Rennie, uh, he'd done honours in anthropology at Oxford and was very much, in some ways, a frustrated anthropologist, and was very keen to further anthropological research in, in Vanuatu. There had been nothing done since Layard and Deacon in the, well, Layard in the 1910s, or the same time as Malinowski, and, and Deacon in the 1930s. And then Deacon died uh, before he ever got a job in academia. So, say, Rennie was very keen to, to have more research done, and he made a proposal to the ANU to share the expenses of, res of research uh, in Vanuatu. And in my comparative work on, on Melane Melanesian secret male societies, the most classic area was northern New Hebrides. So I was immediately fascinated when there seemed to be money and there was a possibility of doing research there, so off I went. And so that's why I went to work there. Though I must say, if there have been similar possibilities of working right here in Nepal, because I really have been utterly totally fascinated by it. And I had a fairly long period here, about four or five months. And I would have come here like a shot, but South Asia, I mean, John was Africa, but there was absolutely no knowledge of South Asia at all uh, in, in the anthropological field. At the end, New Basham had just arrived, but uh, uh, that, that, that was, he had only just arrived. And, uh, that, so anyway, that, uh, I went to work in, in Vanuatu, and, and I'm not, the area I went to work in was supposedly full of all these cults, and all I found were people going to church all the time and cracking open coconuts, which <laughs> posed its own, I you know, it was indeed very interesting, but not at all what, uh, that, it, it didn't touch that romantic side, and also the intellectual interest in extreme forms of masculinity. And, 
and then that, that, that had, has always intrigued me, uh, which I'm sure relates to the, the gender structured life I had in Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, boarding what, schools and... Uh, boarding schools, all male, yes. and, and pretty, you know, very much modelled on the English, so slightly softer perhaps in the English, uh, being Irish, but even Anglo-Irish, but still very much, you know, there was bullying, hierarchy, secrecy, we had our own little cults around smoking and drinking and whatever up in bushes in the mountains. Uh, that fascinated me. And then about the other third of my life was family life, which was almost completely... My father, very gentle, retiring sort of man. He didn't figure very largely, and of course, absent fathers, I mean, in the office as well. There was sister, mother, and our whole flock of, of female cousins that constituted this domestic life, which was like heaven. It was full of warmth, fun, later on some sensuality. Uh, that, that, I had a very acute sense of two worlds, male and female. So all of my work ever since has been really around gender. First of all, all the male stuff, and then beginning in, in Nepal, uh, straight into, well, not straight after, preliminary work on the basics of Mewa. Baha structure, Newa Buddhism, I was immediately attracted by, well, well, two things, of course, the Hindu-Buddhist interface in looking at things like Machindranath and Kumari for that reason, but above all, Kumari, because she was female. Uh, and and that, that also underpins my later research in Ireland, again, to young girls having visions of, of uh, the Blessed Virgin. So, yeah. Perhaps I'm jumping ahead no, of myself in there too, too, too much. Uh, Not at all. Uh, but your, your first uh, exploration of, of Central Asia and the Himalayas was in the 50s, I take it. Um, when was it that you actually returned to Nepal to conduct research here? 1967. Enormous changes so, have taken place in Nepal yes, during that time. Yes. Um, had you maintained contact with the country at all or with people you met here? Just the odd letter to two friends, Luchi out here, promote Shamsir Jung Baharana in these tumble-down palace opposite the King's Palace, who I was just having breakfast with this morning. Yes, uh, so yes, well, there's been correspondence. And what was the yeah. constellation of factors that did bring you back to Nepal? Was it an opening up of research? Yes, that's right, in Australia? Yes, the whole thing had uh, begun to very much change, first and foremost in Southeast Asia, but it became possible really to, to do research by, by the, the late 60s, wherever. Had you become so pretty quickly a part of the anthropological establishment? Uh, well, when I... a job and... Yes. With, uh, with I mean, it was an extraordinarily good time. I say Elkin told me, you know, that story. Yeah. But by the time I had my PhD in 1962, there were new universities just beginning, um, Macquarie University in Sydney, Monash in Melbourne, and... Uh, a bit later, there were other ones in West Australia. Well, as West Australia, no, they had got anthropology. Well, within the next five years, mushroom, you know, they were must mushrooming as, all over the world, I yes, suppose, yes. and they all wanted anthropology. So suddenly, there was a huge uh, marketplace for undergraduate teaching of, of anthropology. So I, you might say I hit the jackpot in terms of there I was at the PhD. So I got a job instantly at, at Sydney University for just one year as a temporary tutor, and then. Uh, lectureship was advertised and I got it. And you, you didn't think of maybe trying your luck back uh, in the old world? Yes, I did, and, and uh, really t once, and I'm really glad I failed to get it too. I applied for a job at Queen's University in Belfast just a few years before uh, things really blew up in Londonderry and things got nasty. Uh, so yes, I was very glad somebody else got that job. <laughs> And by then I'd married an Australian uh, woman and started to have Australian children. You know, my roots were sinking, mm -hmm. you know, developing and spreading through friendships, colleagues, and, and above all, family. Did you uh, take citizenship, or how did, how did that work? Uh, eventually, only yes. about five years ago. I see. But, uh, I see. Uh, but you can take dual citizenship, so I remain Irish as well. Mm -hmm. Did, did the family become part of your research agenda? I mean, yes, uh, in Nepal, wife yes. Wife and children to the field? Well, when, in 1967, there, there was just one daughter. She was only one, one year of age. 
probably a bit of a misadventure, it's a bit too young in many ways, there were quite a lot of problems. Well, first of all, she had six months in Ireland, and uh, there were all kinds of problems there with my mother too, and my mother hissing at my wife. <laughs> but uh, they arrived here, yeah, and in the height of you know, April, uh, the temperature really beginning to boil. Within one month, the poor little girl, she was just beginning to learn to walk. She, she fell off a wall up there in Kimdor into a great mountain of nettles about this high. <sighs> that she nearly died, yeah. and, and that, that was pretty horrendous. But she, she, she was there all that year, and then I came back in 72, there was a uh, second daughter, who was then, what age she was? 68, yeah, so she was better, much better age, and Carrie, of course, then was, was older. We were here for nearly a year then, mm. and then again in 78, for this part of a year, and all three of them were there, running up then into their early teens. So yes, and my wife, I've always, my ex-wife, should I say, but still a very good friend. Uh, we've had a family life here out at, at Kimdall. Mm -hmm. In fact, the house now that is the school, Mike Trishishu, we were the first occupants of it. He built it initially for us, in fact, and then my, my wife started a little school for my three daughters in that last year, and that gave him the idea of, of having a school. I see. So it, it's very emotive when I go back to that house I in see. all sorts of ways because it was a family house quite a long time, and Nucci's such an old friend, and now to see him teetering on, uh, at the edge of death. It's, mm. uh, sure. it's, it's a very emotive uh, visit this for me in all sorts of ways. One, getting that manuscript, and, and two, uh, I feel cycles turning in themselves. Mm. That's the first time in my life we're going to feel a bit old. Interesting. Well, also that you've managed to juggle uh, different and competing research agendas over these years, that it wasn't binary on or off, you know, Vanuatu and then Nepal, but these things have overlapped and probably Always inform overlapped, each other. Always overlapped, yes, and inform each other, yeah. Yes, uh, the nearest time. I've never explicitly compared, uh, other, well, in one article I never actually published, where I do compare different notions of virginity in the Pacific mm. and here and in Ireland. I first gave us a seminar paper at uh, Trivine University about four or five years ago. No, seven, seven years ago. So it's been cooking still, and I'm still tinkering with it. But I did publish a, a co collection of papers for uh, Malahar about five years ago, and the five papers on Pacific research, five here, and two long chapters on the Blessed Virgin and visionary stuff in Ireland. Mm. Did the yes. Irish research come, come later for you? Was that a, a, oh, yes, yes. a desire to return to the country in which you grew up I, and also... I, I, for, for a long time I had that kind of ambition that I'd love to. And it seems to me that, well, now it's commonplace, but in the early 80s it was not, not really commonplace for... I mean, there was still very much focus on the other in anthropology and, and very little research being carried out by anthropologists in something like much less directly their own society. I always felt I'd love to, to, to do research in Ireland. For a long time I had thought of actually working with uh, the gypsies, the tinkers, the traveling folk. But, well, somebody else started to do it, do it well, and, and it just seemed to me overwhelmingly difficult. It's, it's become such a huge crisis. And the parallels are, are, are it's, it's so awful, the life that they live. It's, it's even worse in many ways than the Aborigines in Australia, and I just didn't feel I could handle it any longer. And I was thinking about this at the age of about 50. Uh, what triggered it off was, a, it was in 1984, at the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald, a report, had the Irish finally gone off the rockers? Words to that effect. And it was the first report of large numbers tens of thousands of Dubliners and from one of the cities from Belfast to pouring into the countryside, uh, claiming that they could see statues of the Blessed Virgin movement. I thought this this sounds very good. That that happens elsewhere, but in Ireland it had never happened. And the Irish like going to, to witness such miraculous events or you get a feel of it in Lourdes. But there's with only one exception, uh, there's no visionary site in Ireland. And that actually I 
disposed of it myself along with the, with the Jewish philosopher at Trinity College Dublin. It's a total fraud. Uh, what's it called? Um, Locke. About 1880. So, I mean, it's not, not just in the Irish tradition. It struck me that something very odd is indeed going on in Irish Catholicism. Not just that you've got, but there's such a mass phenomenon. And all the press were there, and the whole of Dublin to Tilly was agog. Uh, all kinds of middle class people were rushing out, and they were claiming in surveys of buses that 90% of each busload could swear that they could see this statue moving, though what they actually, how they interpret is another matter. Well, that, that, that made me immediately get my pen out and start applying for an ARC grant. And to my utter amazement, I managed to get a fairly substantial one. Uh, and so I, I went off there in 1988, and spent a full year, and then again in 1992, and frequent short visits ever since. Was it for you a homecoming, or was it in a way a, an anthropology of a country which you had a fondness for, but had had never felt quite part of, also, yes. also the religious component. I mean, it was precisely what you weren't mm. in Ireland, wasn't That's it? That's right, yes. It must have been an interesting and somewhat it, ambiguous it, role. It, it was, yes, and it's not only ambiguous for me, but it was ambiguous for uh, the people I was working with. Uh, because immediately they, whatever, of course I explained very quickly my background, but sometimes, you know, somebody I just met casually at a grotto in a big crowd starts talking to them, they wouldn't know I haven't mean, got to the point of explaining anything about what I was. They'd know like a flash that I was a Dublin, even despite my 40 years in Australia. So then, I mean, there, was, there was ambiguity on both sides. Amongst those I got to know well, the, the particular vision, in fact, the first, the major visionary was the waitress at the time, at the hotel I was staying in, and that it was that, that that's why I stayed in it because it was the centre of one of the most intriguing of all the, the cults. So I was right in, in the thick of it, and and very quickly I, I became very close friends with all all of that family. And the most difficult thing I had, I think, of all, was they they were full of great aspirations and hope that they were complete believers, and the, the, the whole family they had two. Two members of their family were actual visionaries. Uh, that 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 I would become a believer. <laughs> that one of the biggest triumphs of all would be. Of course, uh, and I explained that not only was I a Protestant, but I was not even a Christian. <laughs> that, that I had become a non-believer, not a disliker, but a non-believer. Non uh, just somebody fascinated in religion, in all religions, and so on. Uh, <laughs> for somebody like me. <laughs> To, to believe would, would, would have been, there was a great desire and also a concern, a sort of friendship concern that uh, if, how can this, I don't think they saw me as a nice bloke, <laughs> uh, be so mistaken. And, and that was fairly, fairly difficult to handle. Uh, I don't, not, 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 uh, not to the point of, of uh, distress or anything like that. But I did find, you know, that I used to go then with groups of Irish pilgrims to areas on the continent that they'd all been to, above all Medjugorje in, in Bosnia, I think about two-thirds of the Irish Republic between 1983 and still now, they're still going in vast flocks to Medjugorje. Something like 40 million, according to some calculations, others 25 million, uh, not Irish, but Catholics all over the world, have been to Medjugorje, another major visionary site. So I started going with uh, little Irish groups of, of believers, and uh, one occasion with the young girl who was then about 12, 13, who was regularly serving me breakfast and who was still having visions. Uh, well, she was, that's not quite correct, she was having inner, what they call inner locutions, getting messages in her head from Our Lady where she had been having uh, major visions, and she was really being sent by her family to uh, Medjugorje in the hope that the visionary stuff would come back again. Uh, but actually, it was the turning point. She's, she's now an IT technician in, married to a Belgian in Brussels. <laughs> have, you, so, have you followed over the years the growth of, in the Sai Baba? Followings in yes. India and Nepal, yes. of course. I mean, it's even penetrated Kathmandu now. Um, so, uh, Sai Baba, his, his portrait is over my bed. Up the <laughs> do you see? I mean, do you start seeing parallels and constellations of, 
of belief coming together because to be able to draw based on field work in Ireland back into Nepal from Nepal I suppose to Vanuatu. Yes, of course, indeed. Uh, the diamond is still puzzling what, what, what to do with it, but uh, the, the global aspect is, is uh, enormous. It has to be with Catholicism. What, what has made it more, in a sense, global in Ireland, I suppose, is just the, the modernization of Ireland. They suddenly have professors. The fact that so many now have the money to, to go regularly every year to Lourdes, to Fatima, to, they, they'll go to, to, to uh, one of the, the visionaries, a woman now of about 40, actually. She's forever being asked to, to go around the Caribbean or to the Philippines on lecture tours. Uh, financed by wealthy Catholics in these areas. Uh, she, 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 the way she described going on a, a luxury cruise through the Caribbean and it, it the main entertainment for all the wealthy tourists in the evening was listening to her talk about missionary stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> the uh, global conference circuit. Yes, that's right. Did, um, did your family also accompany you back to, to Ireland in the 80s or were the children grown up by then? And, uh, Yes and no. They, they they came over with me for, at the, on the first occasion, just for a short time. But they they were all engaged in other things. They couldn't stay very long. But they were all they're all going themselves individually, frequently. So the, the Irish identity is definitely part of their lives as well. Oh, very much so. Absolutely. Yes, they have very strong Australian accents. But mm -hmm. <laughs> they certainly uh, they like holding the Irish passport, both for sentimental and practical reasons, because it gives them access to jobs throughout the EU. Uh, two of my daughters have had uh, jobs you know, on, on that basis. Yes, yeah. One of the aspects I was wondering about, I suppose, is uh, is that of Nepal. When you come here as a as a scholar, there's been a large American involvement, of course, in Nepal in terms of scholarship, and a large European one. But in terms of one doesn't immediately think of Australia very often as a country that's produced many researchers of Nepal. Yes, uh, Do you try. present yourself as an as an Australian scholar? Or, or an Irish one, or a combination thereof. I mean, do you? Uh, I, I, I suppose more Australian in, in recent years. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, uh, up up to about thirty years ago, Irish. Yes, and especially anywhere in Asia, uh, because I think the Irish, uh, you know, there's a sentimental affection for the Irish, and any, especially in any part of the the ex-British Empire, <laughs> and especially in India or Pakistan. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I find it easier to make friends or to be accepted in some way, to, to, be, to be Irish. Australia, indifferent one way or another, uh, to, to be British was... Uh, uh, since I sounded British, I've made clear that I was not British. <laughs> Could you talk a little about I, that? That wasn't so in, in Nepal, of course, uh, no. having been colonized. Sure. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, I suppose, your early years of field work in Nepal and the kinds of people you were meeting, both you know, local and also international, uh, the research topics that were being discussed? Because one has a strong sense of schools of anthropology, which I'd like to ask about yes. later, perhaps. Yeah. Definitely you know, a French school and uh, a British school. Mm. Was an American school, and those Nepal is a perfect example to see those, yes. those disciplinary concerns played out. Um, I suppose, in that respect, you were free of affiliation. You were not being asked by professors who had been working in Nepal before to pursue research in a certain way. Perhaps you could talk a bit about uh, the people you met and yes. your research interests here. Well, I mean, first of all, foreigners. I'm uh, for foreign researchers, and especially in the 60s, I. I they were, they were as rare as dog's teeth. I mean, I, I didn't, didn't meet many, or if they were around, I didn't know about them. Uh, Did you meet uh, David Snowgrove and Christopher Vua Heimendorf? Or? In London. Not here? But not here, no. I see. No. I don't think he, even by 67, though, I don't know when he last came here, so a very, very long time ago. Mm. I remember talking to him. I went to, to London before I first came here in, in 67. To try to learn Nawari, but when I got there, there was no Nawari being taught in the Pearly. So that was a bit of a frustration. But yes, I saw quite a bit of, of Fiora Heimendorf and Snellgrove then uh, and talked about their work with them. 
And I suppose I was feeling myself very much as, as initially as following on from Führer Heimroh, who I wanted to further explore into what he called the elements of Newa social organization. Though I really had, hadn't much idea uh, what, what direction to go. Uh, and and the, the, at, at the beginning, my, my, uh, there was quite a bit of literature, especially India, Indian anthropology, on sacred centers. Uh, Swayambu, uh, that's where I first lived and clearly is a fascinating place. I thought I initially might begin to focus on it as a sacred place and try and unravel some of the immense historical and cultural complexities that uh, are involved in, the, in that place. And also because my friend Nucci also lived up there, so it was going to be residentially very handy. Well, I, I spent a lot of time there at Swayam, more often than not, sitting in the grass and looking at monkeys and working out their social organization. <laughs> I was so utterly confused and I knew I was never going to, apart from the difficulties in Newari, I was never going to learn Tibetan. And I wasn't all that interested anyway in what they were doing. I did, when I go in here and chanting, I quickly get bored and whatever. But then I began to discover the, the, the Newa community up there. Uh, that, sub-branch of the Bajrachari, I forget you know, what they were called, they are, they are full Bajrachari, the, the Puruvits who carry out all the daily rituals. There's all the Newa families, in fact, up there that in turn uh, do their duty. So I start observing all their rituals and making contact with a number of individuals, a man called Sanakai up there who's long, long since dead. He, he became a, a wonderful informant and, uh, and they were rituals, but uh, the, the, the rituals they did up there. But then I suddenly, that, that, that opened my eyes to the fact that this was just one tiny bit of a vast or a Baha Bahi organization. So I went back and checked the Pure Heimendorf stuff, and sure enough, he had some rudiments about it. So then my attention switched very much to, to that in part. And, and though I didn't, because I all, all my fa I established the family in a nice house over there. <laughs> Uh, I didn't upheave you know, and, and go to pop, which I probably should have done, but it meant an enormous amount of traveling backwards and forwards mm -hmm. uh, and very much working through a few individuals that I'd make arrangements with to meet rather than... So I was not getting classical anthropological material of day-to-day -day life the way David Gellner subsequently did. But I, I you know, it's a bit, it was a bit like Hemraj Sakya. I had long, and many of them from him, long lists of Bahas and Bahis and the Kacha Bahas, and, uh, and then beginning to do censuses of them and genealogies and uh, of a few key ones like Ho Baha and Chiba and so on, about half a dozen, and Kwa Baha as well, and began to build up a, a reasonable notion of some of the, the elements of the internal organization of this and the kind of rituals that they were were carrying out. And that then led to the next stage, I thought, to, to look at some particular cults in, in greater detail. First, Machendra Nath, I've never really published anything very much on it. Father Locke took over there, and I thought, oh, well, I'll leave that to him. Uh, and Kumari, yes. But th throughout, I never had much contact with, with, with other anthropologists. Mm. Did you? In conferences, I'd meet them, you know, when I wasn't here uh, at Madison and places like that, or in London. It's partly because I suppose I was living a family life too, mm. and when I wasn't, sure. and, and, and this fractured nature of fieldwork of kind of, you might say, taxi anthropology almost. Yes. Uh, and also uh, because I suppose much of my own anthropology was defined by the idea of the village. And where you yeah. go, and you don't, you know, you don't come back until you're finished. <laughs> yes, and that's exactly, of course, what I did in the exactly. initially, and was a very much floundering how to handle a culture in a, this bread eagle sort of manner all yes. over the place. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Was was a language and, and learning uh, Nepal Bas or previously known as Nawadi yeah. uh, an important element for you? Was that an entry point to penetrating well, the culture, or did you work with people who spoke Nepali as well and English? I, I never, I mean, partly being deaf, also tone deaf, also, uh, as Nucci would say, oh, Michael, you're useless. I tell you ten words today and tomorrow you've forgotten eight. <laughs> I am absolutely hopeless with languages, there's no question about it. 
I was reasonably fluent 20 years ago in, in Nepali, but no worry, I, I could never even begin to, uh, I, I could, you know, pick up the drift of the topic at, at the most, but no way could I articulate it. No, I did not work in Nepali, so I always had to use an interpreter, somebody who did speak Nepali as well, or even better, English. And I must say, Nucci was, um, nine-tenths of the time I was with him, as interpreter, so it is very much not that I wanted it. I would have, I'd given my right arm to have learnt Nawari, but I, I knew I never would. Uh, so it's it Margaret Mead type of anthropology in many ways. And that's another reason too, I mean, there were, I gave you one reason why I went to Ireland, but another reason was, because I, I was aware then of uh, uh, an early contact with David and was became apparent that he was doing the very things that I wanted to do if I'd only speak. Right, let's get out of this. <laughs> there are other people around who can do it far better. Huh. Your contact with Nepal, of course, and with friends here has endured and yes. described that this is, of course, a very emotional and personal visit as well as a professional one. Yes. Has that been the case also for Vanuatu? Have you returned there? Do you have ongoing oh, yes, relationships? Yes, yes very much. I was there only last year. And then Every few years I'll be back there, and, uh, mostly now just to see friends mm. and uh, adding to the sense of transformation. Mm. Yes, that's, I was going to ask about the, the social change. I, I remember in an interview that uh, Professor Alan McFarlane did with uh, yeah. Heimendorf. Heimendorf says at a certain point, all these young people are coming to Nepal these days, and they all want to study social change. Mm. How can they do that if they've never been there before? <laughs> and of course, but you have precisely the historical yes. perspective to to shed some light on these mm. things. What have you seen as the great transformations of the Kapu New Valley where you spent so much time? Yeah. Well, it's uh, just t totally obvious. The, I mean, the, the, the huge change is the demographic one the co and all the complex consequences from the huge flood of of people into the valley from I don't know, it was certainly less than one million in the valley in the early 60s and late 60s. Forget what the figure was, maybe about 800,000 or something. What is it now? Over five million, I think, in this tiny space. And all the things that go with that, the disappearance of three quarters or two thirds of the rice fields into brick kilns or buildings. Uh, when I first came here, there were only six Model T Fords. There's now a multitude of vehicles belching out fumes. Was Kim Dol, in a way, outside of Kathmandu when you were first? Oh, absolutely, here? yes. Well, the Changi was a lovely open, it was co common land you know, for grazing. You've got goats grazing on it. And the army just slowly, they always they had a little bit of it, but they just gobbled it up bit by bit by bit, right up now to the, the whole lot, virtually, in a varying way. Well, not virtually, absolutely. Part, some parts that uh, some very wealthy individuals managed to get hold of. <laughs> and it's not, you know, you know, when I go around the side of Swayambu and look towards Balachu, that was a long, long, beautiful stretch of, of country. I thought it's all three or four story houses everywhere. So, I mean, that, that's the most obvious. And, and with it, uh, the fact that it's so, so much more a mixed community, because huge amount of that increase has been people from non Newa people from outside. There have always been, of course, non Newa people here, but obviously the Newas have, must have greatly de declined as a percentage of the population. But the other change is one thing, and, and, and once I find myself always fascinated with, with continuities. And I went yesterday to Indra Shastra, probably the ninth time I think I've been there, or something like that. And it's changing hugely, quite clearly. Uh, above all, it's changing as a state theatre. It's becoming more and more a st state demonstration of its grandeur, its power. And the, the, when the, ki the king comes out on the balcony, in the, in the past it would have been mainly the civilians, uh, politicians, Important dignitaries, maybe the odd poet. Now it's about two thirds army, uh, colonels and generals and field marshals laden with medals uh, and a sprinkling of the ambassadors. It is, it's, and waiting for the big event 
the amount of army came in, the huge trucks piling out all over the place. Not always looking very sinister, but uh, really a kind of theatrical show. And with the bands playing and everything else, that, that side of it is enormously multiplied. But the core of it all is absolutely identical, you know, and everything to do with the Kumari and Sawa and Baku and uh, Ganesh dancing around. The general crowd behavior—it's it's as as if, as if always. So, so it's yeah, and it's. I think most especially the Nawas have a, an extraordinary uh, determination to, to to retain identity, perhaps accentuated in fact by the fact that so many non-Nawas all around them that. that I mean, a lot of rituals have been carried out now probably in a technically more correct and full way than they would have been 40 years ago. Uh, there are more experts around, there are more uh, determination to do it right. <laughs> mm. On the topic of the Kumari, um, of course, the very concept, the idea has captured the imagination of many, you know, a jurist, a filmmaker, mm. a writer. Um, mm. Have you become part of, in a way, the production of, of general knowledge also on the Kumari, and do you see your work being invoked uh, by, by by people who, who like to talk about it? Yes, I mean, I'm endlessly in journal articles, not academic, you know, popular articles, especially here, and newspaper articles, and, uh, and, and some of them, the misquotations or whatever of this use, or, or even just uh, Embarrassment over what I said myself that was correct. <laughs> I mean, correct. That's what I said. <laughs> Wouldn't say now. Uh, yes, yes. It, it, it obviously has been because uh, uh, it's gone into three editions for a long time, and it's about the only significant publication at all on Kumari. But it still isn't apart from the, the fascinating new book that the next Kumari has just written. And there is another one, though, on the on the way. Uh, a man called John Mellership, another Australian. Uh, he's a very weird kind of character, a very independent scholar. Uh, very difficult to categorise what what he is or what's going to be in his book of Kumari. But he informed me just a while ago that it's uh, about, about to go into press. Do you mean? Can, do you do you, uh, visit with ex Kumaris who you've known over the years as well as they're part of it? So you're. Yes. Your, your circuit of visits and friendship here in Kathmandu. Yeah, uh, not so much in Kathmandu. But ye yesterday I went back to the the, the most of the, the the Kumari I've had the longest connection with. The one most intimate knowledge of is the part. What what was the part in Kumari, but she still is, and that it in a way. I and mean, I went to her house that they, which is the same house of the official Kumari in part at the moment. It's her niece who's the official Kumari, age ten. And this one that I first knew uh, when she was, I suppose, about 10, she's now 50. And she, her face is identical, <laughs> almost identical, partly through makeup and partly because it's so sad. I mean, she, she's so absolutely childlike. Uh, she, she never goes out of the house, even at 50 now, uh, other than on those few occasions that the Kumari, and she still goes out on the official occasions, even though she is in the back background. So that, I mean, that, that was quite extraordinary, and the, the only other member of the family, and, and to make it even more weird, the whole house was being reconstructed, and I said, we had to battle our way through bits of corrugated iron and over bricks, and I put my hands on the banisters and took them out all covered in paint, and in the middle of it all, in a tiny little room, the only room that was, was hadn't been knocked down, uh, on a bench like this, in, in comes. She's now so so fat, uh, sitting here, and then the other end, the little new one. And then I was plonked in the middle, and, and cameras were clicked, and it was very very weird, indeed. Uh, it made me very sad, actually. Um, there's an issue that uh, one of the things that I've perhaps been most criticised locally over is, is uh, well, it was actually a misinterpretation of what I was saying. But 
representing some beliefs about ex Kumaris and difficulties they face in life, as though I was saying that indeed they do face these difficulties, which in fact sometimes they do. But the, the beliefs are often very exaggerated, such as uh, husbands are regularly falling dead because of the uh, lingering power of, of the devi within her, or they made a mistake doing puja or something of that kind. Those things obviously are largely nonsensical. In fact, this uh, autobiography, uh, Rashmila, is very much intended to try to counteract those, those misapprehensions. But the belief certainly, um, uh, 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 and in many ways, you know, the part of Kumari, it's not only the beliefs, it, 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 it does seem to me to have wound up in a particularly tragic life. She's been, never been educated at all. Now, of course, the, the younger one, yes, she has, uh, from the state, uh, she has a tutor who comes in and, and teaches her quite a lot, and she even knew a few words of English. But she's almost done the older one. She can scarcely, yesterday was the first time I've ever heard her speak and it was just a few words, and to add to it, her brother, who's a very, very talented painter, an art painter, I've got some beautiful paintings of his at home. He's, he's been dumb from birth, he can't speak at all. So you get one, one who's been rendered dumb by culture, and the other dumb by nature. It is just, yeah, well you're asking, do I visit that, that, that family I have visited again and again and again, whenever I come to Nepal, and, and I feel now, uh, I always felt happy enough when the mother was alive and the, it d didn't seem too sad a situation, especially when she actually was a Kumari. But now I feel almost guilty going there because in some ways my devotion is as it would be seen because I do, do go through the honorifics and whatever, make offerings. Uh, it must be a factor in perpetuating what now seems to be a very tragic scenario. Mm.